Hey, what's up, guys? Today, I sat down with Philip Heller, who is a professor of computer science at San Jose State University. His research uses bioinformatics to study the impacts of climate change on our planet's oceans. He's also written about five books on Java programming and has nearly two decades of experience working as a software consultant in Silicon Valley. I really enjoyed my conversation with Philip and I'm very excited to share it with you guys. One thing to note, um, during our conversation, he brought up the first Star Wars movie and I told him I never watched a Star Wars movie, but I promised I would and give my debrief here in the intro. And man, I was actually really surprised and blown away by how much I enjoyed the movie. Um, I feel like most of the Star Wars content I'd seen is sort of some of the newer content and being able to watch the, the original movie really put into perspective what it must have been like to be a fan of sci-fi movies back then when it released. So great experience. Um, if I were to pick out one favorite scene, I'd say it's when R2-D2 and the gold man, who I forgot the name of the robot was, when they were at the, um, they touched down on the planet and they went like separate ways, but eventually found each other in some convoy that picked them up um i thought that scene was pretty cool so yeah if um there's any feedback you guys would like to share with me i'd love to hear what you guys have to say in the comments and without further ado here is atlas 021 philip heller device a more of your meditation for it gives our inspiration Professor Heller, thanks so much for being on Atlas today. Call me Phil. Great. Um, the first topic I wanted to cover with you was Silicon Valley and then also your transition to research after your time in Silicon Valley. Um, I know we touched on a little bit your experience working at Next. Um, you could start off wherever you'd like, but I'd love to learn more about your experience in the Valley. Yeah, so I graduated from UC Berkeley, 77. And really, if you wanted to do something interesting, go to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And I did that a lot, worked for a bunch of companies, um, had some really good experiences, um, had a lot of fun. Um, the last thing I had that you would call a job was working directly for Steve Jobs for Next Incorporated, which is where he was after Apple fired him and before he came back and, uh, and took it over. Uh, I was only there for about five months and mm. uh, I had the honor of being personally fired by, uh, by Steve. Wow. Um, and then after that, I was, uh, I was a consultant. I was a contractor, so I would do quick hit jobs and then go spend my money on a on a ski slope or uh, uh, or scuba diving, uh, then come back and do it again. And eventually, I wrote a bunch of books about programming in the Java language. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had seminars about well about why you ought to buy my books. And so that worked really really well up until um, let's say the early two thousands. Uh, and then the economy shifted and jobs were still around, but they weren't fun. And I started looking around for something else to do. And um, I'll be honest, I was trying to impress a woman. Um, I started dating a woman who was a professor. And I realized she had a PhD. A lot of her friends did. Hmm. All of them had something in their life that they were fascinated by, really self-motivated. And I thought, I want that. So um, I married the professor. And I went to uh, San Jose State to get a master's in computer science, but with an emphasis in this new science that just sounded fascinating called bioinformatics, which is compute, mostly is computing about genetics. Mm. And the goal of it is, um, a lot of it is about health. Um, if anyone in the audience got a COVID vaccine, um, bioinformatics made that possible. Mm. Um, and I got my master's and I wasn't satisfied. So I went to UC Santa Cruz and got a PhD in it and um, got to work with the guy who ran the Human Genome Project. And Santa Cruz was great. The one thing about it though, is that mostly their science is about curing cancer in humans, which is an, an enormous project. Cancer isn't a thing, it's a whole bunch of categories of things. So there's no one cure, there's a bunch of cures. That was amazing. The problem was that being in those research labs was kind of like being in the Silicon Valley startups that I was trying to get away from. I was looking for something different. And I met 
an oceanography professor who just had that light in his eyes, like when you meet a, um, a surfer and you just look in their eyes and go, oh, yeah, you're a surfer. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted that. And I realized they also wanted some sort of personal relationship with the oceans of the world. Mm. So I started working in that lab and I found that the techniques applied. Like you and I are mostly salt water and there's a bunch of DNA in us. And bioinformatics is about listening to the story the DNA has to tell. Mm. The ocean is a bunch of salt water with a bunch of DNA in it. And marine bioinformatics is about listening to that DNA and hearing what story it has to tell. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting hearing you differentiate maybe what's driving a lot of people in academics, or at least people that you met, and what you can typically characterize the driving force of a lot of people that enter Silicon Valley, right? I'm sure if a person is going through all the effort of getting a master's and a PhD and climbing the ranks in academia, it oftentimes is driven by just innate curiosity, right? And love for the subject matter. Whereas I'm sure um, your experience in the Valley probably showed you that a lot of what drives many people in the Valley might just be making as much money as possible or maybe getting some sort of status, right? I'm curious if looking back at when you entered Silicon Valley, if you always felt like what drove you was this innate sense of curiosity and that wasn't very compatible with the um, drivers of other people, or if maybe you started off being driven by, you know, the idea of making a lot of money or having a big impact or gaining status. And along the way, you sort of came to your own and felt as though, no, I need to like change, I need to make a change and pursue something that I'm actually innately curious about. That's a really great question. Um, I'd love to say I was always altruistic. I don't think I was. Mm -hmm. um, it was a long time ago. And I think at first I was just making money while I figured out who I was. Uh, and then I kind of got caught up in it because the money was really good. And I realized I was not doing any harm to the world. So morally, no reason to do anything except keep on going. There came a point where I realized that it matters what you program about. And then I realized no one else was having this realization. And that was in my early 50s. And that was when I started looking around for something else to get into. Um, and I was very lucky I found something that's um, ennobling. Mm -hmm. um, at one point, I was working a contract for a company, getting paid really quite tasty money per hour. And they made a robot that tests wafers, which get cut up and made into chips that go into computers. And I was writing software to control that. So I was sitting there typing on my computer. Mm -hmm. And somebody came up with a cart with a better computer on it. And they said, we're upgrading your machine. This will take half an hour. Please step aside. So I did. And half an hour later, I was on this better machine and all my files were already there. And I was just back to work, but more efficiently. And I thought, wait a minute, who's in charge here? Did I just see a cycle of, of chips using me to create better chips? Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, you know, no, but I want to get out of this cycle. For like a cog in the machine? Like a cog in a machine, and it wasn't a people machine. Mm. It wasn't even for people. Yeah. Um, and now with AI getting bigger, um, I really believe that a lot of people have lost sight of what it's all about. Mm. What it's all about is humanity in the natural world, um, not developing technology because it's cool and we don't really care what it does in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely want to get into your research. And I also had a question um, that we can get on later on about AI and maybe its use case in some of your research yeah. in um, bioinformatics. But just to sort of round out the discussion about your experience in Silicon Valley, was there any experience at any startup that sort of stands out as, um, you know, you're looking back and you're like, man, you know, if I could just go back and experience that for one more day? Uh, Sun Microsystems. Um, mm -hmm. It's not very well known now, but it was the big thing. Um, it was sort of on a par with Apple or Microsoft at the time. Computer manufacturer? Computers, okay. yeah. And I was just in at the right time, uh, at the right place. And I never became super rich on my stock, but that's on me. I was the manager of demos. 
So my job was, here's a computer, write whatever you want to make our stuff look really cool. Mm -hmm. And so I got to, I got to do that. And then I, I got to give demos for all our most important guests. And these would be people like, um, at the time they were famous, like famous musicians, um, George Bush senior, when he was vice president, um, people like that. Mm -hmm. It was just really, really cool. Any demo experience stand out with a celebrity? Um, Peter Gabriel, I don't know if that name rings a bell, no. but maybe some of, some of your audience mm -hmm. um, were, and he came and he was just, he just had curiosity and he was really interested in how can I use this machine to support my own creativity? Mm -hmm. And um, I really liked meeting people like that. Um, later, I had another job with that company where I was doing university marketing. And mostly what I did was fly around the country and go to campuses, and I love campuses, and meet scientists. And they would show me what they were doing on our computers. Mm. And I loved that part. Then they would ask me for money and donations, and I hated that part because I couldn't help. But um, I loved the first part. Yeah, I really resonate with your example of um, meeting someone that seems to be driven by innate curiosity. It almost feels like the reason why I feel so at home when I'm at universities and why I enjoy um, sitting down and interviewing people that are parts of universities because it feels like universities have this magical way of capturing people that are driven by their innate curiosity. So to be able to have conversations with people um, about what they're most interested in and have it be so clear that, you know, they're just driven by this curiosity about things that they were really interested in when they were children and now they're older and they have all these tools and they're building off of the foundation understanding that all of our ancestors who predecessed us worked on um, has been really cool. When you look back, is there any examples of researchers whom you look up to and you think have had a big impact on your approach to research or maybe your approach to thinking about problems? Absolutely. Um so when you get a PhD and you want to become a professor, it's a good idea to do what they call a postdoc. So a postdoctoral position. Um, I, I spent a year doing that mm -hmm. at Moss Landing Marine Labs. Um, and the idea is just get a little more experience under your belt, maybe a couple more publications, um, make your resume look a bit better. And I was working for a guy who's retired now named John Geller, mm -hmm. um, kind of famous in his sub area, which is, um, invertebrate marine ecology. So not fish, but say octopuses, things like that. And he was a very good scientist. But by the time I got there, I had already been in contact with nothing but very good scientists. I knew how to do very good science, but John went beyond that. Um, John had the moral dimension exactly right. I never heard him say an angry word. I never even heard him say a sarcastic word. I remember the one time I was sarcastic to him and I realized that hurt his feelings. And I kind of made a vow not to, not to be sarcastic to him anymore. Mm. I feel I've been given a gift of words and I don't want to use my gift of words to hurt people. Um, the way he treated people, his ethical standards, uh, not scientific ethics, that's that's assumed in this business, but his mm -hmm. his standards of respecting everybody and being kind to everybody um, led me to a realization, which was, this is not the century where science is brilliant people alone in an office. Uh, we already figured out E equals MC squared. There's not gonna be any more of that. It's gonna be collaborations of people like me with, um, who know how to do what to do with data with people who are in some totally other field who have got too much data and we need each other. So, you know, there are jokes about science runs on inspiration, perspiration and money. Ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fourth thing in that and that's kindness. And maybe not last century, but this century, um, it's the most important thing. Mm. And that's what I learned from John Geller. So I, I raise up his name. Yeah, one of the things that I remember experiencing growing up and being interested in business and learning about the best or what we would regard as the best um, business leaders and executives is that 
when people would speak about a person like Steve Jobs, Elon can be thrown in there and other executives that we all know, there seemed to be what I thought of or what felt like an excuse for bad behavior, meaning great leadership requires you being bold and sort of walking over people and achieving desired outcomes by brute force. Experiencing um, through your postdoc and through your research and collaborating with others, as you mentioned, you know, the increased nature of like collaboration and research now versus back then when it's probably white Caucasian males that were in their 40s, 50s and alone in a room, not really collaborating, were the ones at the forefront of science. And now it's so collaborative with different people and we have technology enabling that. What do you think those experiences have taught you about what optimal leadership looks like? And maybe um, some misconceptions that people have had throughout the years about what a great leader looks like. Well, I think you're absolutely right that the ones who don't mind stepping on people, um, that's a more interesting story. So those are the ones that we hear about. And you know, the, the bookshelf section about great leaders in the bookstore, um, it's all about the, the mean ones. Mm -hmm. The nice ones don't get a book um, and they don't become trillionaires, but they don't have to be because they're satisfied with what they have. And I think the best leadership example that one can set is simply being satisfied and knowing what it's all for. Um, you and I aren't at universities that get PhDs. The highest it is is a master's degree. At the PhD level, you have to be a world-class scientist and you have to mentor your students and you have to teach your classes and you have to be on various service committees to turn the university into what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, that's impossible. Something's got to give. And quite often what gives is kindness to the junior students. So there's a lot of hazing. Um, really? Even in research? Oh, yeah. Context. Okay. Yeah. Sorry to say. I think not at um, places like state, the whole Cal State system. It's a different kind of professor. It's a different kind of job. Hmm. Um, it's not necessary to step on people to in order to succeed. I don't think it's ever necessary, but there it is. So I think this idea of being willing to use people or use them up. Um, it's kind of uh, the mark of a sociopath. Um, and that comes from clinging, from greed, from like Steve Jobs said, all he wanted to do in life was make a dent in the universe. There's nothing in there about a good dent or a bad dent. Um, the people who want to make a good dent know when they're satisfied. Mm. And they understand that it's not a good dent if blood or tears were spilled making it happen. Yeah. Um, I moved here to SF State's campus beginning of last year. And I had always, always been interested in Silicon Valley just as a place and the impacts it's had on the world. But I really started looking into its history, um, even if it's, you know, I just have a rudimentary understanding of it beginning of last year. And I came to what I think is an understanding of the dy just like a general understanding of the dynamic here, but I'd love to hear your perspective on it and see if it's accurate or representative of your experience. It seemed really cool to me that Silicon Valley throughout history has seemed like a pl place where young people that are ambitious, competent, intelligent, and curious go. They work with each other. They make projects. Some most fail, some succeed, eventually through reiteration and growing in experience and incompetence the likelihood of success increases, 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 right? Um, companies that are amazing and have this transformative impact on the world are built, they have the impact. And now the cohort of um, young people who are now old and have built these businesses are capital allocators. And then they look for the new cohort of young people who are coming here and trying out all these crazy ideas to make the world a better place. And it seemed like there was almost this cycle of capital and support and guidance that I really resonated with and made me feel really excited. I'm curious if that may just be a naive thought or understanding, uh, me being a kid and not actually being in the arena, as they say, would have, or if maybe there's some truth to that, um, maybe if that was representative of your experience in the Valley. 
Yeah, no, I think pretty much. For example, when I was at Sun, um, one of the founders became a venture capitalist. So not the billion dollar level, but the tens of billions of dollar level. And um, a couple of the technical people who I had known became advisors to him. And then he just made so much money first off his sun stock and then off his investments. And then he used that to, to fuel more companies. Mm -hmm. The one place where I don't agree with you is um, the idea of this energy and these products make the world better. Mm -hmm. They make the world different. And I think it's very telling that the word that people are using is disruptive. Let's change the world. Um, my personal belief is that a lot of these technologies are neutral. Um, and in this, I would put every social media product. It's for communicating. Is what you communicate good or bad? Well, that's up to you. So I don't think the people who made Facebook X get to claim that they improved the world. Some people improved the world by saying world improving things on this media. Um, I also believe that the world should be experienced directly and not through a screen. And so the very idea of what product should we make is has a bias in it. And that bias is we ought to make software products. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have enough software products. I think what we need to do is direct people toward the actual world because a lot of my work is dealing with the climate crisis. And the less we interact with the actual world and the more we're just in our screens, the less it's gonna matter. And then they will wake up one day and there will be no atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You said a lot of things so far in our conversation that I really resonated with, you know, being driven by kindness, having consideration for the ethical implications of your work. What advice would you give to a young person like me and the young people in the audience who are planning to hopefully enter the valley and make an impact in their lives on sure, you know, going and trying to make a livelihood for themselves. And even if they enjoy the attention and, you know, the status and all that is nice and, and, and fun, what advice would you give on an approach that builds others up, has consideration for the humanity of humanities of others and making sure the positive, the, the impact is positive instead of having this like tunnel vision towards like success, um, dollar signs and impact, uh, disregarding if the impact is like positive or negative. Yeah. Well, first thing, um, I think everybody in your situation is allowed to graduate and get a job and pay off those student loans. Um, get your feet under you first. And it's okay to postpone the ethical dimension that long, as long as you're not making weapons of mass destruction or something like that. But just always know what your value is. Know yourself and don't let other people tell you who you are. Um, now, knowing yourself is a really hard thing. And the way to do that might be to take a bunch of university classes and then go work at a bunch of companies. Um, but do whatever it takes to figure out how you can give something to the world. What can I give is a much more nutritious question than what can I take? Mm -hmm. um, what can I take will only get you so far. Uh, what can I give will, will give you more than it costs. Yeah, I think therein lies one of the big challenges that all young people face is coming to know themselves. I feel like, you know, we're first kids, then we start going to school, and then we care what others think. And our actions are sort of guided by the feedback we receive from others. Um, how did you come to an understanding of who you were as a person when you were young? Really good question. I don't think I had a clue who I was uh, until I was in Silicon Valley for a while. Mm. Um, I was in a marriage I had no business being in. And um, realizing I needed to leave that was, uh, was a big part of it. But then, you know, at one point I found myself thinking, I don't know what I want. I only know what I don't like. That's okay. That's a very good beginning. And mm -hmm. setting aside what you don't like and what isn't a value creates the space to look around and say, what do you, what is important to you? And to me, it was, um, 
the natural world. Uh, and then also I, I really valued writing and communicating. And uh, I took a chance on becoming an author so that I could develop those, uh, those skills. Yeah, and being interested in the ocean, I'm curious too, do you think there's something, do you think you could articulate what it is about the ocean that makes it a part of who you are? Or is it something that's like not, um, it's something that it, it's impossible to articulate and it's just something innate? So there is a numinous dimension to it that, you know, the, the best things can't even be thought about. Mm -hmm. And the second best things can't be talked about. So we're talking about the third best things. Um, there was a moment that was the most expensive conversation in my life because I was talking to um, a man named John Zare, who's, I don't know if he's retired now, but he's one of the, a really well-respected uh, Pacific Ocean uh, marine ecologist. And I wanted to go work in his lab for my PhD. And um, he said, there are more bacteria in the ocean than stars in the universe. And we know more about the stars. And at that point, it was like something clicked inside me and my heart woke up. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized I want to study the ocean. Um, and I knew that when I graduated, I had just put a limit on my salary mm -hmm. and I would be making about a third of what I would if I just stuck to the straight and narrow, graduated, moved back to say San Mateo County, got a job for a big pharma startup and uh, went back to sitting in a cubicle and writing software all day. And it would have broken my heart to, uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. By studying the ocean, I felt a sense of, um, I looked at it differently. I felt a sense of relationship to it. And um, I realized that like, if I beat Santa Cruz looking out over the ocean, that's not the ocean. Mm -hmm. That's the surface of the ocean. Um, interesting stuff happens there and then there's underneath. Yeah. Even in my own life, I feel like, man, especially before last year, I had no idea who I was. So insecure as a kid, it really felt like most of my behavior was driven by what others thought of me or what I thought others thought of me. Right. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what it is, but I feel like music is who I am, but, and you know, I, I was working on music a lot. 2021, 2022, and I just couldn't get myself to record. It almost felt like all of my insecurities would congregate in front of the microphone. And it was oh. like, I had to climb that mountain every single time I got there. And only now am I starting to develop the confidence to overcome that and, and start recording. And I think it taught me, at least in my experience, that a lot of what finding yourself is, is having the courage to do what you're afraid. And almost like if there was a radar that you could use to find your way to who you are, it's the what you're most afraid of, right? Um, I think that's often true. And at any rate, the fact that you're afraid of it means it deserves attention. Mm -hmm. And that exact thing might not be what your thing ought to be. Yeah. But I'll bet it's close. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I graduated with my bachelor's vowing that I wasn't gonna go back to grad school, like ever, I was done. Um, and then PhD school especially was, I was 55, but um, frankly, I thought that I was the moral superior of many of my professors, mm. but uh, none of that mattered. This was like, you're in the army and you're a private now. Get in line and be exactly like everybody else. Um, yeah, and I was, I was really, I really had to break down my own ego and set aside my ego for a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes I tell people like, if you want a PhD, check your dignity at the door and it'll be there for you when you graduate, but um, it's not gonna help. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think the idea of what you're afraid of, um, or if you're not aware of any particular fear, just whatever makes your heart beat faster. Yeah, it was striking hearing you um, talk about sacrificing that like theoretical pharma job, right? For yeah. a career that may not pay as much, but would fulfill that sort of need and longing to be engaged with the work on a level that maybe we can't even comprehend as humans, right? What, and, and it seems like I'm almost facing this dilemma as well now, you know, you're young, 
you're going to school, you have these opportunities to work at these big companies with questionable uh, incentive structures, right? Yep. But the paycheck is big, right? And it does seem like you need a certain level of courage that's hard to swallow in order to make that decision. And there's also a lot of uncertainty, right? Like whether the decision is correct, whether I even know myself enough to be feel confident in pursuing what I think will allow me to discover more about myself. If you could speak to the young people listening, me included, that are struggling with that dilemma right now, what would you say, and I'm sure you'd probably make the case to, to be courageous, right? How would you, you make that case and present that to, to a young person? Wow. Thank you. I, I don't have kids, so I don't have grandkids, mm -hmm. so I don't think about this very much. So I'm going to um, blunder around mm -hmm. for a bit with the answer. I believe, it's a long time since I've been your age, but I think I remember, I believe you already know what's right and what's wrong and what's good for you and what isn't good for you. Um, nobody gets courage. You become courageous by doing what you're afraid of, and then you get the courage, which is backwards from how it should be but it's how it is. Um, but if you know what's right, and if you know what's sort of, what should I say, psychologically nutritious, mm -hmm. um, then it's really important to be still and just listen to yourself. So disconnect from all your electronics and all those outside voices and all that information that has very little value. Mm -hmm. You can't connect with what has value to you if you're too busy connecting to what has neutral value. Um, really, most of the tweets that anybody reads don't matter. There is very little information that matters. Um, so you have to have the discipline to just be still, sit, meditate if you're, if you're up for it, and just, um, just hang out with yourself and that's how you're going to know yourself. It's like meeting someone new and go, hey, you want to be friends? Yeah. Well, how do we do that? You hang out. So you have to hang out with yourself. And um, I really believe it flows from there. Yeah. And even going back, you mentioned um, social media companies and the impact social media products have had on the world. Seems like, man, you know, like I grew up middle school, Instagram, YouTube, just at my disposal. Um, and I just like stay up on social media all day. And it was part of how my brain developed. My, my brain developed um, with these products almost, right? As an extension of like my mind and how I think. And it seems like, you know, it's obvious a lot of these products value and, and, and work on our dopamine circuitry and um, make us prioritize short-term gratification. And that seems to be the biggest challenge and what most of what me and other kids my age and my friends struggle with. It's so hard to like tune out the short, um, short-term gratification and the, uh, the, um, the shallow information, right? Not deep information, not yes. information that's thought of a lot and, and more information that's sort of like a reactionary and emotional, right? And a lot of the information that we need to pay attention to in order to drive us to make the decisions that would be the most beneficial to us is the type of information that's hard to pay attention to enough, right? Yeah. It's boring. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think there's a lot of value if you turn off the the worthless information mm -hmm. and you just notice what's coming up for you and the sense of i don't like this i want to go back to instagram um that'll be one more thing that comes up and you notice that and your relationship to it yeah um and that gives you some control over your relationship to it and you don't have to do it all at once but um there's this saying that i really like the map is not the territory. So all the information is kind of a map of the universe and where your friends are at, but it's a map mm. and it's an imperfect representation. We have a perfect representation. It's the world itself. Um, and learning how to look at it and interact with it, um, it's very valuable, very satisfying. And, you know, as a scientist, that's, that's what science is, is taking some tiny little speck of the universe and saying, okay, that's mine. That's the part that I'm really going to look at and interact with directly.
Mm. Um, and I think that's why scientists love science. So, you know, in your field, yeah, actually it's probably similar. Um, but then also when we're not doing, when we're not being a Silicon Valley employee or when we're not being a college professor or student, like who are we and, and what are we? It's like, if you look at the world instead of the screen, then we experience something much bigger and then we become much bigger. Mm. Yeah, and, and going back to that cycle that I sort of outlined that it, it, it seems yeah. explains this dynamic in Silicon Valley of you know young people work, gain experience, build, and then guide the, the younger generation. I'm curious because I'm not too familiar with sort of the function and the social dynamics of a laboratory. Is yeah. this something that's also seen in, in laboratories and in research and in science where you're like a young researcher and eventually you have your own lab and guide younger students? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's beautiful because it's not based on money. Mm. Um, so if you're motivated by greed, you're not gonna end up there. So when we say laboratory, uh, I'm basically a computer scientist. So when we say my laboratory, that's actually, I really should say my research group mm. because there's no room that is the laboratory. I work with people who have a laboratory or many and just actual rooms, but let's say research group. So, um, as a Cal State professor, I get compensated for mentoring students. So um, I can take in, it's mostly master's students who I take under my wing for their, their second of two years of their master's um, experience. And I give them the most important part of those two years, which is they do independent research. And I give them a sort of peel off um, a problem for them to work on. And then I'm their mentor in that. And they learn how to do science by doing science. And the way I do it, what I insist on is everyone's gotta be kind to each other. And by the time they're just about done, a new cohort has come in. So I've always got the senior people mentoring the junior people. Mm -hmm. And then now and then along comes, um, along comes an undergraduate who really understands what True North is. And, uh, I'm also compensated for taking them under my wing. And, you know, I used to think, wow, I could be their parent. And now I think, oh, I could be their grandparent. Um, uh, I was in a room once with a 21 year old student and she said, mind if I play some music? I said, no, go ahead. And it turned out it was like my kind of music, Bob Marley and the Wailers and Eric Clapton and the Grateful Dead. And I said, uh, who made this playlist for you? And, um, I thought she was going to say my dad and she said my grandfather. Mm. And uh, so I had to, uh, I had to take that on, but a grandfather is, you know, you trust your grandfather and your grandfather's kindly. So that, all right, fine. Guess I'm that age. Mm -hmm. um, but someone who's say 19 might have trouble relating to me, might be intimidated, not by me, but like, I don't know. Um, the fact that there's a podcast about me or the fact that they have to call me professor um, and they can relate better to someone younger. Mm. So I give my, my graduate students get the chance to mentor somebody. And then also I don't identify as white, mm -hmm. but I get that I look like a white guy. And it's really nice to have a close relationship with a mentor who looks like you. And um, so, San Jose State is like San Francisco State. It's very diverse. So um, I, I try to make sure that happens as well. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm Mexican and it's interesting seeing different um, cultural norms in a place like Mexico versus the US. Whenever I go to Mexico, it really strikes me the difference in how young people engage with the older generation versus here in the US. It seems like those who have lived an almost full life and have all this wisdom and experiences are cherished yeah. and are maintained by the community. And having that open communication channel between the 20 year olds and the 30 year olds with the older individuals benefits the community. It's a really big net positive. And I'm not sure what it is about the US that it doesn't really incorporate that dynamic much. Yeah, universities do. Yeah. But, um, but not the general pop. Yeah. 
I think ultimately, and it's interesting hearing you talk about the struggle older people, some older people have in resonating with younger people. It seems like the older people who resonate the most are the ones who don't focus on credentialism, right? I think a lot of times young people have experiences where they come into contact with older people who are sort of experiencing, you know, their last couple decades of their life and they want to hold on to power and they want to hold on to influence and impact. And they're not very open-minded, right? Yeah. And it's the old people who love to engage as if they were just 20 years old, right? And keep that youthful, open-minded, evolving spirit are the ones that are able to sort of captivate the attention and trust of young people. Is that sort of approach something that you've made sort of like the focal point and integrate into how you engage with young people? And is that sort of like a marker of a person who's older and working with young people, a mark of success versus a marker, maybe the opposite of that, right? Mm -hmm. That's focused on credentialism, isn't open-minded, typically doesn't engage well with, with younger folks. I hear you. Um, it's a bit of both mm -hmm. because my job is I teach them, but I can teach them best if I know who they are. And I'm without hypocrisy, really curious about them because young people are awesome. I love the energy. Mm. Um, I'm jealous of it. Um, when I was 19, 100% guarantee you wouldn't have liked me. Mm. Most of my undergraduate students, I really, really like. And if I get to know them a little bit, I like them better. So that's a reward. And then also that way they trust me. So if I told them, eh, you got to do this, they trust that I'm saying that because it's going to be of value. Mm. So it's, um, yeah, it's definitely two ways. One of my favorite things <laughs> to do, especially with undergrads is have them, um, teach me vocabulary and I don't remember any of it. Mm -hmm. or I don't use it well, like one of them, someone once made me promise to say high key mm. once during my next lecture. So I did. And, um, yeah, it bombed. Like everyone looked at me like, yeah, you used <laughs> that wrong. But I really like being the guy who used high key wrong. Um, it's just more fun. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you said something really interesting there. You said you're curious about the younger generation. And I'm curious to learn more what you're curious about because sometimes I like to think, what would it have been like to be in the Valley working during my, let's say productive prime on the technology, computer, social media apps that then this generation of young people grew up with and were a part of their lives. They don't know a world without these mm. products being as proliferated as they are now, right? Is that something you've sort of like stepped back and thought about? Like, wow, these people, they, they grew up with all these products that I played a role in supporting and enabling the production of. No. No? Because I never worked on that stuff. Mm -hmm. I was a generation behind that. What I really worked on was using computers to make computers better. Um, designing better hardware, um, designing tools to understand computers better, uh, improving languages, things like that. So, but I guess it still applies because they're using products that were developed with those techniques. Um, I do think about it, but that feels like a way to get stuck in the past. And, um, you know, I'm just imagining myself at 95 with a creaky voice saying, hey, you young people don't know what it was like. We used to, I don't know, we used to have black and white screens. I'm not into that. Yeah. I'm also curious to learn, it's interesting hearing people express their outlook on my generation, Gen Z, and even the early millennials. I would guess it seems like you have a pretty optimistic view of young people and the impact you'd probably anticipate them to have. I'd love if you could speak to that and maybe what you're excited or not excited to see play out in the future. Yeah. So 
let's say I'm exactly half optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, and this gets into my research. So, okay, if we take a detour and I tell you what I'm working on. Of course. So, um, the project is called Coral Vision. And the idea is all of the physical sciences now have way more data than they can analyze without computer scientists. And the computer scientists are off making a lot more money analyzing other data, which leaves me. Um, Coral Vision started as helping out a project, which gives me more optimism for the future than anything else. I mean, the, the piece of the world where am I am an optimist or pessimist on any particular day is ocean health. And especially coral reefs, they're the um, rainforests of the ocean. So they're where all the life comes, at least when it's juvenile. So any society that mainly eats fish for its wild protein needs coral reefs. And even more than that, um, coral reefs sustain the life that sustains the atmosphere. Should we think about them like the hospital where the babies are born of the ocean? Um, not so much the hospital as the nursery school. Okay. Um, although maybe a lot of them are born there as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we can see the importance of it. Um, if the coral reefs die, we don't have long to live. Really? And I can't go to a party without somebody I meet mansplaining marine pollution to me. Mm -hmm. And I feel that when they do that, what they're really saying is that they are anxious about the future. Um, now, I don't believe that the future is guaranteed bright. And I don't believe that, it, that we're doomed. I believe our destiny is in our hands. And I tell my students that they can do something to bring about a good destiny. And I tell them I would not tell them that unless I believed it. So Coral Vision is based on these things. We call them plugs. They look like a cross between a golf tee and a thumbtack. So the head is about an inch across. They're made of the same material that coral skeletons are made of. And I work with the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. And if I ever say we here, I don't imply that I invented this technique because they did. But what you do is you put a couple tiny little baby coral polyps on these plugs and they're like three millimeters across and they look like poached eggs. And because of the material, they'll recruit there, they'll commit. And we'll put these, like take a rack of about 80 of them and uh, put them in a water bath of fresh ocean water. This happens in Hawaii. They pump it in and they make sure the temperature and the acidity are just perfect for it to grow strong. And then after a while, they turn up the temperature and they turn up the acidity in order to simulate the ocean later on this century. Hmm. Most of the corals die. The ones that survive have been selectively bred for the conditions of the late 21st century. And they're already on a thing that can be taken down to a coral reef in mass and just jammed into the nooks and crevices. Wow, almost like a vaccine for coral reefs. <laughs> That's a great word for it. Um, uh, my wife calls it a hair transplant. Oh, uh, okay. Because like hair plugs, yeah. you know, you put them in and then later they grow. Mm -hmm. um, now, during the course of these experiments of figuring out what's the best regime for developing these corals, um, periodically the entire rack is carried into a lab and every head of every plug is photographed. That means they're generating hundreds of photographs every week. There always comes a point where it's more than any one human can analyze and the humans ought to be doing something higher level. So coral vision is about using AI to analyze these photos and saying, okay, where in these photos are the individual corals and correlate that to um, the plug from two weeks ago, how have they grown or have they died, figure out what happened to them. And from there compute, you know, the best therapies. Wow. That's coral vision. I wouldn't do it if I didn't believe there was hope. I wouldn't tell you or your audience about it if I didn't believe there was hope, but only if we do it, which is kind of better than a guaranteed golden future because it means 
that we can do the absolutely most satisfying thing there is, which is create our own world. There's a call to action implicit in that, right? It's a call to action, exactly. And not everyone has to respond because not everyone resonates to that. Mm. I just need enough. Um, enough Jedi warriors uh, to join my ragtime, ragtag revolutionary groups that would... I've never watched a Star Wars movie. <laughs> Are you kidding? Never. Okay, well, I just... I will, though. I, okay, I, because otherwise I'm going to despair about your generation. Which one should I watch first? Um, the only one you need to watch is... Um, it's called Number Four, but it's the okay. first one that was made, A New Hope. Okay. I'll put it down. I'll watch it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And uh, please don't edit out uh, this moment. Of course. Because uh, you just said it in front of your entire audience. Yep. I'll, I'll put a debrief in the intro after when I record it. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So that, um, that excitement about joining something that matters is really important. And um, it really does matter. And it really is possible. Mm. And um, that's what I love about young people. And that's what I love about my job. Yeah. Um, Coral Vision has expanded to a few other things. Um, there's a kind of algae that we don't know enough about. And it lives in nooks and crannies in coral reefs. How deep? Um, down to fairly deep, but the ones that we study are quite shallow, like 20 feet. Is it? Oh, so it's not so deep that humans can't like go down and see it physically? Oh, right. Yeah. Like um, anyone who scuba dives has seen okay. it all the time. It looks like sort of bubblegum pink um, blobby sticker. Um, it turns out that in the dark crevices, it grows a lot. And kind of like a sticker, it secretes glue that holds the reef together. And when you say dark crevices, that means sunlight doesn't shine much? Right. Okay. Some, but not a lot. And this algae is a photosynthesizer, so it needs sunlight. So people sort of ignored these sort of hidden places because mm -hmm. they thought, well, it couldn't possibly get enough. But it turns out it does. And so we, um, we used to go to Maui and dive to these reefs and jam GoPros in. And what's a GoPro do? It captures more single frames than you can possibly analyze. So we're, again, using AI to analyze those and saying like, well, how do we characterize um, the places that make this algae healthy? Because as the ocean, not so much warms, but as it acidifies, um, the corals are denied the kind of calcium that they need to grow their skeletons. And so they get crumbly. Um, so this kind of algae is helping hold it together. And we need to uh, we need to study it more. Do you really enjoy scuba diving and seeing sort of like the coral reefs that your research is having an impact on? I love scuba diving. Mm. It's, it's the best. Um, there is no video of diving that will give you the sensation. And um, the first time you breathe underwater, it's a miracle. I would love to experience it. It sounds terrifying. I can't swim, so I'm not a big washer person. Oh yeah, swim first. Yeah, but I've always wanted to have an experience where like I could be in the ocean and like breathe and just like sit down and yep. observe everything down there. And with scuba, if you go to the right place, um, you're going to see spectacular beauty. Mm -hmm. I was going to say breathtaking, but you don't want your breath taken away when you're, you're breathing through one of those things. Yeah, I'm also curious to get your perspective in your area of research, what impact AI is having and how much of an accelerator of progress it seems to be in your field. Because I like contrasting, you know, speaking with different researchers from different fields, it seems like in some of their fields, AI is, wow, this thing that's going to accelerate the rate in which we um, dis make discoveries and accomplish our research S by, by 10, 20, 30 X fold. And in other areas, it does the fit doesn't seem to be there. Yeah. When you think about the impact AI is having and even in the example, um, with the coral reefs, does it seem to be a really big deal on how research is going to get done? It's the big deal. Um, so I mentioned that bioinformatics is studying DNA. So I don't do that very much anymore. Now I'm analyzing these photographs. Mm. So you might convince me that I don't get to call that bioinformatics anymore. I don't care what we call it. Um, but how do we analyze photographs? Well, a digitized photograph is just a bunch of numbers that represent the color of pixels. So a bunch of numbers is perfect for input 
for AI. And what I do is, it's called segmentation. So any picture, if I were to show you a picture right now of anything, immediately before you're conscious of it, your brain will have segmented it. Say, that's a thing, that's a thing, that's another thing. Segment like objects in the picture, or segment like categorize it like this is food or? Um, objects in the picture, okay. what, are, what are the objects? And then a later layer of your brain will, do, will identify like that's a sandwich, this is a microphone. Because I have seen pictures where there is no object. It's like a AI generated picture, but the whole point is there is no object. And you almost feel like a little bit anxiety looking at it because you can't identify any object. And it's sort of disorienting. That's a really interesting point. Mm -hmm. um, we get anxious when we can't see a pattern. This is very dangerous because we would rather see a bad pattern or a dangerous pattern than no pattern or a pattern where we have to work harder than we want to, to see a pattern. Um, and so ooh, we get uh, the current situation in society. You can even connect that to when there's a person out who may be under the influence, but their behavior is so erratic and different to the point where like, there isn't anything about their behavior per se that should directly lead us to feel scared, but just by virtue of us not understanding why they're moving the way they're moving, it incites yes. like fear inside of us, right? Yes. So with AI segmentation, um, you just get a report. This, here's a segment and uh, that the AI has 91% confidence that, yeah, that's a thing. So we segment the images, then we identify the things that are in the images. And so this is nothing that the human brain can't do. It's just the human brain can't do it at the scale that we need to do it. Um, another data set that I have is about 14,000 photographs of, they're called settlement plates. It's just a plastic square, about nine by nine inches. You bolt it to the ocean floor, you come back in 18 months, when it went down, it was a slice of plastic. And when it comes back up, it's a habitat. And in order to identify everything that's on it, if you've got one, you just find the oldest marine taxonomist you can find, buy them a couple beers and take notes. Not enough beer in the world to analyze 14,000 images. Mm. So we need coral vision. And as whatever model you're using continues to go through that segmentation process, I'm assuming it's also being trained on its past experiences, so to speak, of segmentation and becomes more and more accurate. Uh, so that's one way to do it, but it's super hard. Okay. And so what we do is uh, when we have data, the first thing we do is we have scientists identify. Um, they just sit down with us and point out like, this is a that, this is a healthy coral, this is a sick coral. This is a bubblegum pink, um, good guy algae. And so we have what we call a training set. And we need anywhere between a couple hundred and a thousand of those. It's actually not hard to, to get. And then you, finger quotes, train your AI by just showing it all the things and telling it what they are. Um, it's kind of like having a dog and you want to train the dog to sniff, I don't know, drugs. <laughs> So you have the, the dog sniff some um, uh, heroin. You say, that's heroin. And the dog might think it has to smell exactly like that to be heroin. Well, you want the dog to generalize. So you give it a couple different kinds of heroin. Hmm. And now it's going to generalize. You don't want to, you want to train it on enough, not too little and not too much. And this is exactly what we do with, with AI. We give it training sets. And at some point, it's trained to our satisfaction. We like the results. And at that point, we trust it. So we then give it the other 14,000 images. And we say, analyze all of these. We trust your outputs. I mean, we're going to spot check. What does the interface look like from your perspective? Is it sort of like a GPT style interface where you can give it prompts and have a conversation with it? Or is it a little bit different? Um, it's way different. Okay. Um, it's... Python code embedded in, my big thing is, uh, if this means anything to your audience, um, writing um, large Java visualization programs. So you sit down at a, at a custom screen and you tell it, over there, those are the images I wanna analyze. Over here, this is my training data. 
you push a button that says train. And that takes a while. You come back in a while and says, okay, I've trained. And you say, okay, thanks for training. You've now created what we call a model. And then you say, you sort of click on the model and you say that model, this data go. And it analyzes all the data. And then the output is the original image that got analyzed with annotations, with certain things circled in nice bright colors and numbers that say, what's the confidence mm. or a label that says, well, this is healthy coral or sick coral. I had a quote here in my conversation agenda and questions that I had for you from National Geographic that was saying only 5% of the ocean has been explored. And we can sort of connect this to what you said earlier about there being more bacteria in the ocean than stars in the universe, which blew me away when you said it. Do you expect, if you had to guess, that if we had like a, a meter or a progress bar of like how much we understand about the ocean, it'll increase in like, let's say 1% increments? Or do you think something like AI will make the progress bar look like 5% and all of a sudden there'll be this period of rapid discovery and it goes up to 40, up to 50, up to 60? Um, the finish line of that race is always receding. There is no finished. Because we're talking about, for example, life in the ocean. Um, these bacteria, their generation is one day. They're constantly evolving because their environments are constantly changing. So we don't even know how many species of bacteria there are. And if we tried to count, that would be like counting all the people on the planet. Hmm. By the time you're done, some have died and others have been born. So if theoretically we were at 100%, Right now in this moment, by tomorrow, we would not be at 100%. So right. where you're getting at? Yeah. Interesting. Um, by how much would it recede if you had to guess? Can't guess. Can't guess. Can't guess. I'd love to know that answer. Yeah. Um, enough to make it interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and evolution is about adaptation to changes in the environment. And the environment's changing a lot. And actually, there's no such thing as the environment. There are habitats. I don't like to say the environment because it's kind of like there's you and me here. And then over there, there's the environment. The economic environment. There's all different types of environments. Right? All, all different kinds. But when I talk about the natural environment, we are so intimately connected to it mm -hmm. that I like to use vocabulary that doesn't imply that it's a something that is not us. Yeah. And one of the questions I had whenever I hear that stat about just how little we understand about the ocean and the life forms in the ocean is, what would be the plausibility, if you had a guess, of there being intelligent life forms that are maybe so deep down in the ocean that we haven't discovered them? Like, I guess what I'm trying to get is like the nature of the life forms, right? Like, are these just yeah. small bacteria, or are these like animals that are actually pretty big that we have no idea exists down in the ocean? Um, well, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, I say the odds are um, pretty small. Mm -hmm. Because the um, the conditions there are so extreme that any life form would be spending most of its energy and its evolution just coping with these extreme conditions, and it's very hard to um, to evolve um, intelligence as we know it. Um, the almost all exotic life is single celled. On the other hand, I do completely believe in the conscious intelligence of whales, dolphins, and, and their relatives. Mm. Um, octopus, I have no idea. Like, I can imagine what it would be like to be a whale. I can't imagine what it would be like to be an octopus. Yeah. Um, I don't eat them anymore because um, they're too intelligent. And the, the only one that I ever really met was affectionate. Really? Yeah. Wow. You know how a kitten... Sometimes you put, I don't know if the camera's getting this, like you, you put your hand here and the kitten will kind of rub its head against your hand. Yeah. Kind of cuddle your hand. So the octopus did that. Except wow. the octopus was softer than any kitten. Really? Yeah. I feel bad because octopus is actually my favorite food. Oh man, please don't eat octopus. But I'd love to have an experience like that. I haven't really like came into contact physically with animals. You know, the extensive yeah. is just like seeing seals, you know, here in San Francisco, but. So here's what you could do is every spring, except during uh, pandemics, Moss Landing Marine Lab um, has an open house. Okay. So they're sort of halfway between Santa Cruz and Monterey. And uh, it's the best science party in California. 
and um, as part of the Cal State system. Moss Landing is part of um, San Jose State. Moss Moss Landing. Moss Landing. Okay. And um, go. Hmm. Go. Oh no no I I, I just didn't uh, recognize the name but oh, yeah. Moss Landing. I mean, where's you that? Go to Moss Landing. Oh, for the yeah. open house. Got you. Yeah. yeah. So it's a town called Moss Landing. It's this big. Okay. And it's got it's got two big time uh, marine research labs there. Cool. Any animal that you'd uh, recommend seeing maybe other than octopus? Um, well, they have touch tanks there Okay. Uh, at the open house. Uh, you can also go, I really recommend uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Mm, I've been there. I love the aquarium there. Yeah. So um, if you just resolve to not take any photos at all, just hang out long enough, you can develop an interaction with some of the higher level creatures there. Mm. Do you think, and I know this is probably getting to, to wacky town a little bit, but <laughs> with, and maybe I don't need to involve AI in this question, but do you th think there's a future where communicating with some of the more intelligent life forms in the ocean is possible? I think it's already happening. Okay. I do know, and I wish I could remember who it was, but somebody who's worked out enough dolphin vocabulary. So they have a vocabulary. Yeah. Wow. And she's got some way where she somehow puts inputs into this helmet. And I think she wears it maybe underwater or maybe above water. And, um, uh, you know, it's kind of like, um, communicating in, in memes, um, or, or emojis. Mm -hmm. Like it's really simple and I have no idea if it worked, but I knew this kind of thing is, is underway. Um, I'm just hesitant about it. Um, most scuba divers I know bring a GoPro and they want to photograph everything. And I'm worried that if we try to communicate with dolphins, it's kind of like these swim with the dolphin vacations you can have. Mm -hmm. The dolphins are not there for us and the marine life is not there for us. And to swim up to say, um, a manta ray with a camera on the end of a silver stick is a very hostile thing to do and you'll scare them away. Yeah. It seems almost like traveling to countries who may not be as economically developed as us. And then, you know, there's those tourists that will come in in a disrespectful manner. They have like selfie sticks yep. and trying to take pictures with the people that live there almost as a, if it's like a museum exhibit, right? Is that sort of kind of... Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and also if you scare them off, then you scare them off on behalf of everybody. Mm. So I remember one of the high points of my life was, uh, I was in Belize with my wife. And, um, it was just her and me and this other couple on the dive boat. And they took us to this place and we went in the water and my wife and I don't take photos underwater. And, um, the other guy didn't want a camera. His wife had left her camera on shore and she was super unhappy, but the captain wasn't going to turn around for that. So nobody had a camera. And so a spotted eagle ray just rose up and it's like this. It kind of reminds me of the statue of Jesus in Rio de Janeiro. Wow. And its wingspan was bigger than mine. And it's got these two like bulb eyes right in front. And it just hovered there. And I knew that if any of us had pointed a camera at it, they would have captured a photograph forever. But the moment would be gone. And instead, no one got a photograph and we had this memory and we, we all just communed with the spotted eagle ray for at least a minute. So it stayed up there for at least a minute. Just, yeah. Wow. In the light of that, what value was a photograph? Yeah. So there's a greed for the information in the form of a photograph. Mm. And if we set aside this greed, it opens the door to a much richer experience. Um, so this is why I'm, I'm wary of communicating with higher level creatures, if there are any, because too many people would use it for them. And, you know, and would ask the question, 
what can you do for me instead mm. of what I can do for you? Yeah. Wow. That what an experience. Yeah. I, I have this like thought that's sort of like a fun, funny thought, but um, I'm not sure you've seen, I'm sure you've seen the, the Elon Musk Neuralink that he's working on. And I was like, man, I wonder if one day, you know, there's like a Neuralink in like an animal and in a human, and then we could just sort of communicate. And like, if we're gonna build something on this like side of the ocean, we're talking to the dolphins and we're like, okay, let's like negotiate. <laughs> we're building right? it, but. Um, I don't know what the value of that would be, but it would be cool, wouldn't it? Yeah, it is interesting too, to think, you know, if life forms are intelligent as we know they are, what does that mean about our diets and what we eat and what's ethical and what's unethical, right? I know. And I eat a lot of fish, I'll mm -hmm. be honest. Um, I have a lot of collaborators who won't eat fish. It's not like they're vegetarians. They'll eat beef, they'll eat chicken, but no fish because it's like no fish are for studying. Um, Buddhists will not eat anything with the central nervous system. Really? Because if you have one of those, you have the capacity to suffer. Hmm. So I forget if shrimp have one, I think they don't, but like anything smaller than that, yeah, that's fine, go ahead. Huh. Um, I, you know, I sometimes think that I'm unethical in what I eat, but boy, I just love shellfish and I love fish. And I, did I mention I don't eat octopus, <laughs> um, but I'll eat a squid. Yeah, it is funny just like observing human nature as well. It's like, you know, the animals that show us affection in a way that we're not scared of, we're going to give you preferential treatment, right? Like dogs or like cats. Yeah. But animals like chicken or cows or pigs, whom in their interactions with us are sort of indifferent most of the time, it's like easy for us to sort of ignore a lot of the, like, call them kill farms or where they have a ton of these animals just locked up, you know? Yeah. And then there are um, humane kill farms. Mm -hmm. You're still killing an animal. And you're still giving it existence only so that you can eat it. Yeah. I think it would be cool, you know, at some point if we can somehow like grow a really good steak just from some DNA without the intermediary of a cow. I think that would be cool. I don't need much red meat, but I would eat a lot if we could do that. How far off do you think we are from that? No idea. Uh, it's really not something I, I keep my eye on. And... Um, the few impossible burgers that I've eaten, um, they've just been really disappointing. So I think we're pretty far. Mm. Is that, I wonder if that's like unique to maybe how I, or maybe unique to how young people think versus older folks where we like to imagine or conjure up these like theoretical, not utopias, but just like te technologies or ways of living and then think like, okay, what's like the date as to which like when that's possible, right? Right. Is that something that uh, maybe describe how you think or maybe how you thought in the past? Um, so I think when we're little, that's all we do. It's like, what if we could do a, a roller coaster car that didn't need the roller coaster and it could just fly, you know? And it's, it's the beauty of imagination. Um, and then part of undergraduate education is to beat that out of you. Mm. Um, but then there's, you come back to a compromise is like, not only what's good and cool, but realistic. And then a lot of these far out ideas, you have no idea because if it's a really creative idea, we don't even know how far off we are from making the parts that are needed. So I think it takes the courage to have the idea and say, well, I'm now willing to do the dull work, which is, studying the possibilities of making it um, and then making it. What do you think, having lived a life where you've got, got into experience, the proliferation of smartphones, the advancement of compute and all, you know, now AI and all, all the uh, other emerging technologies that sort of come with that regards to how you think about technologies that we still are far out from creating, but are trying to estimate by when could we get this? Do you think that your life experience has sort of taught you like, man, maybe certain types of things are pretty far out, but I have been surprised by how much the world has changed on my time here, or has it sort of made you be pretty more, much more conservative in regards to like, when you expect things to come out? So one of the awesome things about my job is the ocean aside, I also get to hang out with NASA scientists. 
And um, I think the technology we need for the ocean is healing technology. Healing? Yeah. Okay. What we need for space is exploration technology. And there, a lot of imagination is called for. And I get to hang out with people who are sort of planning far out missions, like not next year, but when we get to Mars, if we get to Mars, what are we gonna do there? Um, I work with some people who are looking at the question of how do we keep astronauts healthy there? So that's one of those far out things that takes a lot of imagination. And uh, yeah, we've written a couple papers about it and it's much of it is speculation. It's like, okay, here's what we know how to do and we think we could do it over there. So maybe this is the way to do it. If you're an astronaut on Mars and you get sick, there isn't time to send a message to Earth, have a doctor figure out what to do, and then send that message back. As in the message would take days, weeks, months, or it just, the lag time would be too big in order to like be effective in like a diagnosis? Um, speed of light message, so it'd be about 45 minutes. Okay. So if you all of a sudden get a brain infection, um, you don't have 45 minutes, but it's not 45 minutes. It's 45 minutes twice, plus the time to figure out. So the idea is to have the entire medical history of the astronaut in a CubeSat orbiting Mars so that the, the, the interaction is with something in a, in a low Mars orbit. And that's very fast. And there's AI, the AI doctor is orbiting the planet. Meanwhile, yes, the message goes to Earth. And in case you're still alive in two hours, we've, we've got possibly a better therapy for you. Huh. But meanwhile, this will triage you and, and keep you alive until the human doctors can. That's the kind of thing. Yeah. So I think this is what you're talking about. Like, boy, what if we like flying roller coaster? And mm -hmm. to me, a, a CubeSat doctor around Mars isn't so different from that. Yeah. And it's really fun exercise of the imagination. Or how do we farm the moon? Yeah. Yeah, what a question. I mean, I'd imagine, I'm not sure, I haven't, I'm obviously like um, really unfamiliar with like the soil and what the implications of like moon soil would have for like growing plants there. But would most of those plants be like inside of a ship, I'd imagine, and then? All of them would be inside something. Okay. Like probably a, a mobile vehicle with um, maybe a transparent top. Hmm. Um, I know someone who knows someone who took actual moon rocks from the actual moon, ground them up, added fertilizer from the kind of bacteria that we're going to have to take to the moon anyway. And they're going potatoes. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. I wonder if, man, this is getting to like my curiosity about biology, but you know, my liking and understanding of biology. I wonder if like there's toxins in soil. And then once you add fertilizer and it's like, if it's mixed with Mars soil, then it's like, there's some toxicity to it, right? Um, toxins tend to be not biotoxins, but, um, but complicated chemicals, like non-living chemicals. And we haven't been there to, to add them. Mm -hmm. um, if the Mars soil is toxic, so I'm just guessing, if there were no hope of farming Mars soil, there'd be no point of going. Okay. Because how are you going to, like, if you go, you got to plan to spend a few years there. Yeah. You're not going to haul a few years worth of food, like all that package ramen, um, to Mars. You're going to have to, you're going to have to farm it. And what do you think your conversations with NASA scientists have sort of informed you about what a reasonable timetable to expect the mission to the moon or Mars to look like? Can't speculate about Mars. Uh, that's partly about technology and partly about motivation and capital, mm -hmm. um, to the moon, it's already happening. Okay. So in my lifetime, um, I believe 1969, um, there's a NASA project, um, uh, the Apollo project and president Kennedy made a speech where he said, within the next 10 years, we are going to land a man on the moon and bring him safely home. And we said, man, he meant man. We actually met white man. Mm -hmm. um, so that's changing. Um, the next project, the current project is called Artemis. 
Now, in Greek mythology, Artemis was the goddess of the moon and Apollo's twin sister. Mm. She's a woman. What they're signaling, everything NASA does um, has got attention. What they're signaling is it's women. So the next NASA astronaut to set foot on the moon is going to be a woman. So Artemis One was an unmanned spacecraft, orbited the moon several times and came back safely. Artemis II will have astronauts, will orbit and not land. And I believe that's next year. Oh, wow. And as soon as possible after that, Artemis Three is going to land. Wow. And uh, yeah. And even going back to your point about the, the AI doctors and tracking sort of like human health in space and in moons and planets, I'm not sure if you've um, integrated GPT a lot into your just daily life, but I was reworking my diet and my training program um, a couple of weeks ago with GPT. And, you know, I, I've been using GPT for months now. It's like been a big, really big deal in my life, especially just like in my extracurricular education and how I um, design my approaches to my pursuits. But man, when I was working on it, building my diet, it struck me like, wow, I could have a conversation and, you know, I'd like put it in an Excel sheet and then I take a screenshot and be like, cool, now this is where we're at and now I need to figure out this. And I was like, you know, I need more carbohydrates in my diet. What are some foods that are low in calories since I'm nearing my uh, calorie goal, but are very high in carbohydrates? And they're like dates, dates high in carbs, <laughs> low in calories. And then I was like, whoa, like I've never interacted with... I'd uh, be cautious to call it healthcare, right? But I've never interacted with something that resembles, resembles healthcare in this way before. Yeah. And it made me think about how accessible healthcare and diet is going to be for people who are coming from low-income backgrounds, for example, right? So I think that's an amazing application of the technology um, because it's so cheap. It used to be all you need is a computer. At this point, all you need is a phone. And there are a lot of fourth world countries that are just bypassing the whole idea of laying down um, phone cable. Hmm. They're just going straight to satellite and smartphones. Um, the companies that lay the phone lines, they're so corrupt that it can take years to, um, to, get your, to get a phone line into your home. So don't just buy, just buy a smartphone. Yeah. Um, I'm curious too. I had a section here um, for to ask you about your research applications of space travel. Do you for the projects? And I'd love to learn more about the projects in specific that you've had that relate sort of what you've learned in the ocean to space travel and um, the health of astronauts dealing with microgravity. Um, is there like AI models involved with that research as well? Not yet. Okay. Because I talked about training sets for my photographs, mm -hmm. and I said you need like five hundred or thousand. Um, there haven't been enough astronauts. Um, and so there's a really big push at NASA with some people I work with to say, how do we get actionable information out of the astronaut medical information that we have? Mm. And then there's also a fair number of experiments on flies, rats, and mice, and things, and worms. Um, still not a huge amount. And we're never quite sure like how much of what we learned about rats applies to humans. But uh, microgravity is a big problem. Radiation is a big problem. Um, really, I sort of stumbled into this. Um, there's not a lot of overlap between what I do with the ocean and, and the astronaut stuff. And I, I think the astronaut stuff is a side hustle because the people are awesome and it's so cool to think about it. But um, space travel blows my mind but the ocean has my heart. That's a great way to put it. Um, are there any projects in regards to ocean travel sort of round out our conversation about bioinformatics and ocean that of a, and I know it's tough because of the pressure, right? But are there any projects that sort of excite you about exploring the ocean that are in motion right now? Um, I don't know too much about it. Um, the problem is very few people can afford the kind of apparatus that can go down into the super deep depths. There's not a lot of life to find there anyway, because life needs energy. Mostly we use solar energy. Um, there are like underwater black smokers and volcanoes, so you can get some energy there, but it's very simple life forms. And it's very hard to afford. 
Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in really squeezing the knowledge we can out of what's easily access accessible to a lot of people. Um, like this reef in Maui that we were checking up on eh, before Maui burned down. Um, it's a 10 minute surface swim from the beach and then 20 feet down. Wow. So it's super accessible. Um, and there's so much to learn there because a, um, it's hard to describe a coral reef. Um, like just imagine a sponge, like a, not a kitchen sponge, but like a real marine sponge. And it's got holes in it and the holes have holes and those holes have holes. Um, there's a lot there and a lot of different scales to explore. So there's plenty to explore. Um, I'm really interested in exploring protected areas and you need a certain scuba license just to get permission to, uh, to go there. And, um, one thing I'm really interested in is when we go to the doctor, they take our temperature, they take our blood pressure. That's like your baseline, two numbers that tell us how you're doing. We don't have anything like that for a coral reef. It's too complicated. Hmm. So one thing I'm really interested in is how do we develop something like that? And it, it would be a little too technical to, uh, to get into at this point, but, um, that's what really excites me. Kind of like a device where let's say the devices oh, would be a good example. Uh, maybe we think about offices and how they have overnight security guards, so maybe like a security guard of the reef. And then you have sort of like all of them on like a panel. And then it's like, how is this reef in this location and coordinates doing? That would be so cool. Mm -hmm. I was thinking Fitbit, but oh, okay. it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Um, any device that you want to put in the ocean, the ocean's a really hostile environment because ocean water is very corrosive. And um, even 30 feet down, it's double the pressure of what we have here. Wow. So um, if you want an easy environment to build scientific apparatus in outer space. Yeah. Well, Philip, I've really enjoyed our conversation. The closing question that I wanted to ask you and I ask this to every guest is, if you were 20 years old at this current moment, what fields would you study and what problems would you aim to solve? Um, I'll step up. I would study marine ecology and artificial intelligence. Great. Because I can't imagine a better life than the life I get to have. And part of that is getting to meet people like you and doing stuff like this. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time with me, Philip. I really enjoyed our conversation. Back at you. Mm -hmm.